Welcome back. I think we are now live uh, at our session three, uh, where we are going to have a very interactive panel discussion, and we are going to talk about uh, ed tech and health tech. But before introducing our three very successful leaders and entrepreneurs for this session, uh, let me tell you that we have also uh, for this session, for introductory remarks, uh, a pre-recorded video by another leader, another female leader, uh, Miss Alessia Mosca. She's the Secretary General of the Italy ASEAN Association and former member of the European Parliament and also former member of the Italian Parliament. And throughout her career, she has been uh, a very active leader uh, to support uh, women leadership and women economic empowerment. And she also uh, briefly touched upon uh, these issues uh, in the video. She has recently founded uh, uh, an association called Il Cielo Itinerante. I'm going to share the link in case someone is curious. It is all about uh, young girls and STEM skills. But now I think we can watch the video. Thank you very much for the invitation. I am uh, very honored to participate in such uh, an interesting and high level uh, conversation. Uh, we are uh, talking about uh, the skills uh, that uh, are necessary in uh, this challenging time. And uh, uh, we claim uh, uh, that uh, we need to struggle to uh, go back uh, to uh, normal after the pandemic crisis. But uh, which normality are we looking for? Uh, and it is not normal, it was already not normal to uh, have such huge inequalities between men and women all over the world and in all uh, the fields. And moreover, this is uh, not sustainable. STEM skills are uh, the new alphabet for the time we are living. And it's not normal that uh, they are distributed only in uh, half of the population. To avoid the biases and stereotypes and to promote STEM education among girls and, uh, and also boys, but especially among girls, I've founded with a friend, uh, astrophysicist, El Ersilia Vaudo, an association called the Traveling Sky, uh, whose aim is to uh, uh, try to foster the desire for culture, for STEM culture among uh, uh, girls and boys. With a van and four telescopes, we've traveled around uh, Italy in the most disadvantaged regions uh, in order to uh, um, promote uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, the awareness and uh, this uh, STEM education. These have been uh, the most enriching experience of my entire life. And I have such a, a, and I've seen such a, a huge transformation in the young people that gave me uh, the uh, confirmation that, that even small seeds can uh, generate uh, a huge change in uh, how we, uh, um, how we uh, face uh, big challenges. For this reason, I wanted to share with you this small experience just a as a concrete example of what we can do and what uh, we can create, um, disseminating as much seeds as possible in order to uh, generate the better future for our, for our, for the future generation, uh, for our planet and for uh, the girls of today and tomorrow. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, Alessia's remarks really are uh, setting the, the tone for the conversation we're going to have today, as we're going to talk about ed tech, uh, uh, health tech, and the skills necessary for uh, for this transformation. But now uh, it's time to introduce our three speakers. I'm very, very happy to be uh, here with them. Uh, on the panel, we have Laruk Fazal Ur Rahman. She's the founder of Science Fuse. Uh, she's very active uh, in STEM education and much more, and we will hear from her very soon. Also, Lala Wynn, she's the founder of 360Ed. Okay, it's back, excellent. Um, an ed tech entrepreneur working across different continents, and we will also hear her experience very soon. And also Priya Prakash, CEO of Health Set Go. Thank you so much for being with us today. Now let's start our panel discussion. So we are here to talk about the future of healthcare and education and how these are shaped by uh, digital technologies. So 
What can you share with us in terms of key opportunities you are seeing in your respective sectors? And perhaps let's start this round with uh, uh, Lala Ruch. Over to you, Lala. Thank you so much. Oh, is it is it for me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me? yeah. Okay. Lala Ruk first, uh, and then we will move on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Um, <clears throat> so um, I I just like to start by giving a little bit of um, introduction to um, the work that uh, that we do at Science Fuse. So Science Fuse is a social enterprise which is based in Pakistan. And we are working to improve the quality of um, science education for children in Pakistan, especially those who come from vulnerable backgrounds and children uh, who come from low socioeconomic backgrounds. So um, just to give you a little bit of context, majority of children in Pakistan <clears throat> are enrolled in low income private schools or government schools. And we're talking about millions of children. And all of these children, um, have um, uh, the, the quality of science education in their schools is pretty dismal. <clears throat> so even after 12 years of education, um, uh, you know they they come out of school uh, with with an education which is which is not really equipping them for the for the life ahead. Um, and it's uh, we believe that it's social injustice that you know they do do not have access to all the skills and all the opportunities that a good quality science education can provide. In terms of your question, how um, how you know technology, you know what kind of opportunities we are we are um, um, currently you know um, exploring uh, at the moment. I think because of technology, uh, this is because of the pandemic that we've started thinking differently um, in Pakistan as well. <clears throat> so, for example, our social enterprise before the pandemic was um, working in a manner that all our work required in-person interaction. So we were limited to just one city. Um, so all our programs required in-person engagement. We would visit schools. We would um, you know, be a part of festivals. And all of these engagements are, of course, important. It's very important to be in a classroom physically with the students to inspire them, to make science come alive for them. But because of the pandemic, we've been forced to think differently. And now we are using technology to reach out to more vulnerable communities across the country. We've, we found new ways to ha how we can connect with teachers and students and families that are not, not just restricted to one city, but to many, um, you know, to, to a much more wider geographical area in Pakistan. Of course, the digital divide is a big challenge because in Pakistan, not, um, I mean, uh, not all families have access to um, a stable internet. They don't have access to um, <clears throat> good quality gadgets. And that remains a big challenge for us. So we're working on designing both digital and remote engagements that can, you know, uh, bring quality science education to schools or homes in Pakistan. And at the same time, also working on designing, for example, physical, um, you know, learning resources like science kits, like books, which, which, you know, children can have in their hands. And they can, you know, of course, that, that, that will make such a big difference that growing up, they will have those incredible books and materials and learning resources that can spark curiosity and wonder and, of course, enhance scientific literacy. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you very much. Definitely. Now let's move on with the other Lala. So Lala Wynn, please over to you. Thank you. I'm Minglava. I'm Lala uh, from 368, uh, started in Myanmar and now USA. Um, worldwide, we are facing a massive mismatch of teachers and students, and COVID make it worse. And the rural schools especially have struggled to acquire, retain talented teachers. And in a developing country like ours, uh, there is a population explosion of promising young people, and we're not even close to graduate enough teachers to teach them. And now with the COVID, escalated another layer. And rural education and the bottom billions, it has a direct impact on the rural incomes. And then, uh, for, for example, like in Myanmar, 75% of the population lives in rural area. And the daunting need for the second green revolution with the prospects of 9 billion humans on earth beyond Myanmar. And we need scientifically literature, uh, literate rural talent to do it. 
And now nowadays, uh, the uh, rogue education is, can be as effective as sleeping pills for digital natives like my daughter, who's we born in the digital era or alpha generation. And we need to harness the learner's place and curiosity by incorporating mobile devices into everyday learning. That's what rural area has. And then, you know, bottom billion has the mobile phone, not the computers or the instant connection to the uh, internet. So this mobile learning and digital play, and it is the future of education, I believe. That's why 360 Ed uh, started, you know, digitizing the textbooks into create dialogue, not just passively watching the videos, but uh, creating dialogue with the augmented reality. When scanning certain pages of textbooks in the 3D and 4D object appears, and then science become active. As a teacher myself and mom myself, I really care about the science education because that's a global race that we are uh, being part of. And if science education is boring and just daunting passive learning, the learners, we lose them. So we need to create this visually appealing, interactive, you know, dialogic uh, learning uh, materials with science. So we use augmented reality and mobile smartphone, not only just for the uh, folks who can afford the science lab in the expensive community, but also so to those who have only phones, you know, especially in the uh, COVID time or beyond COVID, but they shouldn't leave out of the uh, access to education. So that's the dream we started uh, four years ago, and now is the time we continue for millions of children in Myanmar and beyond. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lala Wien. Uh, now uh, let's go to Priya to hear a little bit uh, about the health sector and her experience. Thank you, Priya. Yes, thank you so much. And it's so lovely to be here. So thank you for having me. And it's amazing to hear from two other inspiring women uh, right before me. And um, so just to give a background like everyone else about uh, what I do at Health Set Co. So just like education, I think health is a huge problem as well. Uh, specifically in a country like India, which has the highest rates of cancer, of diabetes, of heart disease. Um, I think we've reached a point where chronic diseases, non-communicable diseases like these are pretty much present in every family that is there. And it's not only in India. I think this is a global problem. But the issue is that a lot of these diseases are actually filtering down to the younger generation. So if you see the children of today, there are various health issues that have already cropped up from a very, very young age. So even if you, um, and you know, it was just mentioned that, that uh, Lala, you're a mom, right? Uh, you're a mother. And I think even you would be thinking about the growth and development of your own child. And I think it's so important that we focus on preventing these diseases rather than curing these diseases. And if anyone has ever tried to be healthy um, or tried to change their health habits, you know how difficult it is, right? Um, as we get older, it's even more difficult to do that. And I know this because when I was younger, I used to actually suffer from being overweight when I was in school. And because of that, it really affected my physical health, of course, but it also impacted my mental health. Um, there was a lot of bullying in school. And it's very difficult to even as a young a child try to change your own health. You know, you need a support system to do that. And so when I became healthier and when I realized the importance of health, um, I knew that this is something that every child should have access to. Because if you know how to be healthy from a very young age, if you know healthy habits from a young age, you know, most likely you will not grow up to be an unhealthy adult and we can actually have a healthier country. And so today what Health Set Go does in schools is that we help every child in the school inculcate healthy habits from a young age. And at the same time, we have a team of doctors that goes to schools and we also monitor the medical health of every child. And this is done to detect and diagnose diseases at an early stage, right? So where technology comes in here is that we want to make sure that every child has a digital medical record from a very young age. And it might sound, um, you know, uh, like an outlandish thing, but most people don't have a digital health record from a young age. For example, my own health record, if I think where are my vaccination information, where is all of that, I don't know. You know, it was maintained on a piece of paper given by a doctor somewhere. And so now that digital health has become so important, specifically during the pandemic, I think we see a lot of people consulting doctors online, consulting, uh, you know, getting medical help online. I feel like 
every person needs to have a digital health identity. And what HealthSetGo is doing and what we see as the future of health tech as well is that if we can give every young child a digital health record so that they know what their health status is so that when they go older, they know that, okay, I've had these many vaccinations. This is the amount of times I visited the doctor because it's so important for us to have a medical history. Um, and going forward, this kind of information is going to help us as adults make better health decisions for ourselves and for our children. So this is what I see. And we also uh, believe that every school should focus on health along with education. Of course, education is very important, but health as well should be an integral aspect of that. Thank you very much, Pia, for making this very uh, evident connection between education and health. And anyway, I mean, research shows that better educated people, including, you know, with better science, science skills, typically tend to be, you know, uh, more in good health uh, because of their education and skills. So this is something extremely important. So now let's move on to the uh, second round of questions. So now we have talked about the great opportunities of both in ed tech and health tech, but, but what are the, also the risks and limitations of these approaches? And perhaps this time, let's start the round with Lala Win. Over to you. Um, every challenge or every... <laughs> Uh, obstacles come with the opportunity if we can look beyond it. Uh, right now in Myanmar, uh, we are on top of COVID. Uh, we have this uh, coup data, military coup. So 11 millions cannot go to school. If we think linearly, if we think of uh, traditional education, we try to send kids back to school or we try to send the learning materials, you know, uh, people-based learning materials to home. That is a traditional linear way. But in case of uh, the civic, uh, civil war happening, the logistic is the problem. When uh, safely sending the learning materials to 11 million homes, it's almost impossible, daunting task. It's almost sending, uh, making risk of people who are delivering those products to the, you know, delivering uh, physical learning products to the homes. But in this case, uh, why don't we leapfrog and think beyond, right? So uh, digital learning materials or textbook company, and you know, nowadays uh, it's an opportunity for children to take ownership and also, you know, uh, take part of their own learning. And we don't need to make it boring or passive, you know, just watching videos after videos, but augmented reality is here to stay. And with the cheap smartphone mobiles and then up and coming technology that operates uh, superimposing computer generated images and physical objects that can be viewed through the smartphone application like 368 and prompt by our aim to change Myanmar arcade education system, and we make convenient by the recent bombs on smartphone, thanks to China, <laughs> cheap smartphones, and 360 and now developing mobile apps that integrate augmented reality into the generic presentation found in the public school text. For example, the science learning. We have 60,000 schools, but we only have a few uh, science labs we can count in one hand, not even two hands. And now with the COVID and COOP, no science lab, but we can stop learning science. But how can we create learning labs in the homes of, you know, uh, very rural and basic area? This is where the game of fine learning comes from, right? So it's opportunity, the presenter at the crisis. So many of us at 360, we really enjoy playing games for both education and entertainment. My daughter is six years old. I never have to teach her how to play games, but she intuitively, you know, uh, find games entertaining and learning so beyond only intellectual video game and uh, we believe that education games in the classrooms they can be the uh, highly rewarding tools for us teachers to create dynamic environment for education now parents are the teachers so dynamic environment with the learning games and textbook companions are the uh, textbook companions and learning games together with the um, textbooks will be the way to go. Now, in a uh, case like Myanmar, when the textbooks and learning materials are hard to ship to home safely and 11 million students at risk of, you know, uh, losing education for two years in a row, I think we have to leapfrog and think beyond linear situation and then exponential uh, getting on the uh, digital platform. But uh, still, there are some challenges. <laughs> Uh, some 
traditional thinkers stay going, you know, linear. We are still beyond, you know, we are still behind and playing catch up game. But I think it's time to leave from, especially for countries like Myanmar and in the, you know, ASEANs. We can't afford to go linear to education. It takes uh, forever and it takes tremendous amount of money that we do not have. So we bottom billion has to think really outside of the box and uh, beyond linear uh, thinking, I believe. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lalawin. Uh, this idea of going beyond, you know, the linear thinking, I think is really, really important. Now let's continue the conversation with the Priya to get the perspective from the health tech sector. Over to you. Yes, I think, um, you know, like what was just said, even in health, I think there will need to be a bit of leapfrogging. Um, you know, the way things were done and now the way things are happening because of the pandemic, it's already accelerated, you know, something that would have taken years to happen. The digital transformation that would have taken years to happen has happened in a span of two years. You know, everything in your medical records, your vaccination uh, confirmation, it's all digital. Even in a country like India, where they already know that so many people don't have access to digital modes of, um, you know, accessing their own health records. Still, today, uh, if you go and get a vaccination, the vaccination certificate is given to you digitally and you have to figure out how to access it. And so a lot of the people in India have actually quickly switched over. And like, uh, you know, what was being said that technology uh, to own technology to own phones has become significantly cheaper. So the opportunities in health uh, for having healthcare delivery in the remotest parts of the world has just become so much more. And specifically when it comes to children's health in, you know, an area that we work in, I think uh, when you have information about one child and then you have an information about 100,000, 200,000 children, you can really start to see some trends that are coming up. You know, you're able to diagnose and detect things at a much earlier stage than usual. For example, if there's an outbreak of the flu or there is, um, you know, there's some other disease that is going around in a particular state in India, we'll be able to see that a lot more preemptively. And because of that, we'll be able to take actions. In fact, a lot of this data can inform governments as well, you know, what kind of public health interventions to do in a particular area. And what we want to use data science for in the future as well is if we have, for example, the information that a child is going through a medical condition over a number of years, we'll actually be able to see a trend in that information and help the parent decide what is the best course of action. So I think technology can be used for a lot of good, specifically in the cases of health and education. Some of the challenges that are there in any transformation or when something is being completely revolutionized is adoption. It will take people time to adopt and adapt to certain technologies. And but now, since there won't be any choice for a lot of people rather than to come online, I think the acceleration of something that would have taken the next 10 years is going to happen in the next five years. So I think that is what the pandemic has given us, which is instant technology uh, leapfrogging, as was just said. So I look at it more as an opportunity uh, than challenges. Thank you, Priya. And now, I mean, uh, let's get the perspective from uh, uh, Lala Ruh. Over to you. So I think Priya and Lala, uh, Lala Win have, you know, uh, brought up some really excellent points. I think um, it, it is true that the pa pandemic has kind of accelerated this transformation, you know, the digital transformation. We have to, though, really think about the people who are lagging behind. I, I think um, in Pakistan, we've seen um, in the last one and a half years, um, you know, how the government sector has, for example, invested more in public-private partnerships, how they've, you know, sort of um, uh, gotten on board at tech platforms to see how the government can, can scale some of these solutions. There's been a lot of investment or uh, funding into at tech platforms, and they're growing. Uh, there's a huge, uh, you know, one of the challenges, as I mentioned uh, earlier, is the lack of infrastructure. Um, so many areas in Pakistan still do not have digital access. And, and um, um, you know, when it comes to digital literacy, we are, we're struggling with that as well. For example, if we speak about teachers, they're not digitally literate. They're not, um, they're not sure how to use uh, hybrid learning to, you know, uh, provide that kind of support for the students who are now in the last uh, two years now facing, you know, learning losses. So I think, of course, there's a, 
need for a greater investment from the government sector also from the private sector so that this in this digital transformation we see that the teachers are keeping up these are teachers you know government school teachers in pakistan are already underpaid they're overworked they already lack a lot of skills and 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 knowledge and and so you know on top of that the digital transformation and hybrid learning these are things that they will need a lot of support and there will there has to be more investment in the sector um, you know it's it's not impossible i think the teachers in pakistan have been we have science schools has worked closely with government school teachers and we've seen how resilient they are we've, we've seen how much thirst they have to you know learn new things to adapt um so for example we used whatsapp as a very you know powerful tool to connect with an, a huge network of teachers around pakistan we connected with 650 teachers and we used whatsapp to share learning content with them which then they used and um they then you know had to either visit the children uh, in small clusters or had this uh, the ch- had had the students come to school in small groups when 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 you know because of the pandemic schools were closed down so whatsapp was a very powerful tool and so these are some of the ways that we have to see how how we can um, of course invest in infrastructure invest in teacher training in digital literacy um and of course these edtech platforms there are a few really remarkable ones in pakistan that have really grown in the last uh, two years but there needs to be more investment in in so you know we can build better um, edtech platforms and how and how lala win was talking about not just um you know videos but also more interactive content and content which is culturally relevant so for example in pakistan's context a lot of learning materials that are available online are made for children who who come from different cultures or from different countries it's not relevant for our children it's not in local languages a lot of children in pakistan maybe do not understand english and and the content has to be culturally relevant you have to make science relevant so that it's connected to children's um, environment their local environment and that's what makes science interesting that's how you in- enhance a children's science capital and i would also say that Uh, there are few perks of using technology like for example now that science fuse um as a platform now we are connecting more with a uh, teachers and when you connect with one teacher you can reach out to many more students through a single teacher rather than you know reaching out directly to children both are valuable but through teachers you can reach out to even more students and also we've seen when we made the the switch from in person engagement to uh, conducting our programs for families digitally we saw that the parents are now more involved because children were joining our classes from home um you know using zoom or interacting with us through whatsapp now parents are more part of the equation earlier they were we were interacting with students either at school or at a at a venue where you know parents would just leave their children and now we see that you know the whole family is doing science experiments at home what we're teaching children is um you know the older siblings their parents are sitting and they're making those balloon rockets and they're making um you know water pop and all of those fun experiments and parents are more involved so it's a great way when you know through uh, this was something that we saw that digital engagement or remote learning has its own advantages so you cannot dismiss that but at the same time i would also say that in person engagements have their own unique advantages and we should not forget that in this digital transformation and that's really important as well so i think we need to have a balance of both when it comes to education at least thank you very much uh, lara roch uh, i'm i'm sure that even in the health tech space there are similar uh, considerations because of course the relationship between a patient uh, and its doctor i mean uh, uh needs also sometimes at least sometimes go beyond digital so now for the third round of question um i would like to ask you what i think is a very difficult question at least i mean it would be for me so you need to think about how you know the sectors you are active in uh, are are going to evolve in the next uh, 10 years let's say so between now and 2030 what trends are you expecting or let's say what would you like you know the health tech or tech uh, uh, to to evolve uh, to to see sector evolving and let's start now this uh, round with uh, uh, priya over to you maybe i wanted some more time to think about it there's so much but i'll i'll definitely share um i think uh, 
like you know we we also uh, are struggling to anticipate the rate at which technology is evolving um you know if i think about today the service that i offer to parents children in schools and what that's going to be 10 years later i think it's going to be massively different and when i say that i mean there's there's going to be more of a shift obviously towards the virtual and digital way of doing things um i think today the way healthcare is run is very traditional still there's so much scope for disruption in healthcare that um you know sort of the gate is wide open to give you an example um before the pandemic um you know you had to go to a clinic or a hospital to see a doctor people were very uncomfortable accessing doctors online and now today uh in the click of a button i can access a doctor uh it's like when you order food from an app it says uh we'll deliver that food in 30 minutes or 20 minutes and now it's like i can see a doctor from my phone in less than 2 minutes without even leaving my house so that's the level of disruption that's already happened but i feel what's going to happen more in healthcare is that the job of a doctor is going to evolve a bit more um doctors are going to be able to make data driven decisions rather than making decisions based on the first time that they see you and what they assess from that uh, by which i mean that if a doctor has access to more data points about us and i do believe that we as human beings are sharing a lot more data points about ourselves to our phones to the computer to social media and so uh, if today i want to know lala wins health history i would be able to easily know that and then as a doctor i would be able to put my judgment upon that and then suggest a further course of action so i think algorithms i think data science is going to play a huge role maybe we might not even need to see a doctor just a computer can tell us what's wrong with us they can detect and diagnose diseases uh, that's the kind of future that um i am starting to see and so a lot of the professions are going to change within the medical field you don't need people to interpret uh, radiology reports a computer can do that for you now and uh, as soon as these things become mass market i think that, that there's going to be a huge upheaval uh, plus all of us are wearing tracking devices uh, in health and so uh you know if we are being tracked if we are tracking our own health metrics uh it's going to be much easier for us to take charge of our own health rather than see a doctor as well so i think things are changing very rapidly in the space of um uh, like you know with that gen z alpha uh you know they are going to grow up with technology all around them like a child today is going to be able to wear a, a watch like this and track everything about them tomorrow maybe that device is somewhere else and you know on your phone you can see everything about your own vitals your heartbeat your Or blood pressure at every minute right so things are changing really fast and if i watch this panel discussion 10 years down the line i'm sure that uh, i would be saying things that are completely wrong because we can't even imagine uh what's what's going to happen but i think this will really help humanity because i think technology should al- always be looked at as a way to help and make things more easier and convenient and accessible rather than looking at it as the enemy of things uh which a lot of people do so i'm excited in fact to see 10 years down the line how efficient and accurate um and helpful healthcare can become uh, once newer technologies come in thank you priya then i will have a follow up question but let's uh, move first to uh lala ru um i think as as you know priya mentioned um the the possibilities are just uh, huge and endless you know um apart from um I, i think you know in the space of education this is going to transform so many children's lives um you know if if they have access to and and children are really smart um they you know their their curiosity is inherent you know they, it doesn't take them long to kind of figure out you know um all of these fancy gadgets and new technologies and new things that are popping up it doesn't take them long really i mean a 4 year old a 5 year old you know starts learning these things really quickly and then this this is true for children who come from diverse backgrounds you know um that that, that sense of curiosity and that sense of wonder is there in every child so i think if they have access if, if we have that kind of infrastructure if we have those digital spaces or safe digital spaces and safe platforms where children can um you know learn on their own play on their own using those digital devices and platforms um where they can think where their imagination can run wild and you know 
uh, they can um, not just learn on their own but also hopefully collaborate now not just with people or children in their local areas but maybe the whole world you know um, you know the digital transformation can open up those possibilities as well so of course that is going to change um, uh, you know how how we can actually provide access to quality education to so many more uh, children in in a country like pakistan or or you know even across the world uh, but for that i think um, we need to invest now the policy makers the private sector need to understand how much of a transformation and what what benefits we can achieve um, and also you know the research on 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 education um, like for example in pakistan if we speak about girls education uh, there's very little research being done on what are some of the factors that keep girls away from uh, you know pursuing science as they grow older these are research driven you know uh, questions that we really need to back with you know research and we need to come up with research based um, solutions and so you know as priya mentioned with data science and and you know with with us being able to gather information from households from families and children more effectively we perhaps you know this will change we will understand better or the 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 questions that we have in our minds so what is it that a girl living in pakistan you know when she's growing up in a in a small city or in a big city what are some of the things that keep her away uh, so that you know by the time they they reach 10th standard they don't want to offer science this is a huge trend in pakistan um more girls than boys drop out and leave uh, stem subjects when they are in 10th standard when they have to make a choice you know whether you want to continue science or not and there's not really much research that tells us why this happens so maybe it'll be easier to you know kind of come come up with all of those evidence backed research and that can help educators um and other um, organizations working in the education sector or even policy makers to really make policy which is evidence based um and also organizations that can then design platforms or learning uh, solutions that you know are based on evidence um, and, and i think that that will be revolutionary thank you very much and now uh, to conclude this round uh, lala win uh, what do you want to add i think the future education is dialogic and um dialogue not just in the classroom where teacher and students you know can have the dialogue for that to happen we need to uh start now changing the how we learn you know the time that students have with the teacher in the classroom is a golden hour is very uh very valuable and we cannot just uh waste it with you know basic thing that students can learn themselves but the thing that ai cannot teach you know this uh uh the soft skills that needs to be uh learned and dialogic in the in the classroom and the second is data driven like uh priya and uh, uh laruk said and the third is democratized learning not just for elites you know with the thanks of technology and education doesn't have to be just for the elites anymore you know the quality access to quality education democratized all over and the fourth point is design for skill and sustainability not just project based you know one project you know development partners come and do it and then later when they love is gone you know not just for that design uh with design with skills and sustainability and with understanding of the ecosystem i think it's very important and uh, all this uh, data driven and you know um democratized learning and design for skills and sustainability and dialogic these are the deep impact principle for the education for the future and i believe that the policy makers and then practitioners development partners start thinking all these the uh, concept now not just following the linear trend and you know we need to print how many more papers to send to homes no the future is there future is now and we shouldn't loot the future away from the uh students hand they want fun and learning they don't want just uh you know uh rotary more uh, monologue learning they want dialogue they are demanding like my daughter's uh, generation they are demanding and we should listen and answer to them and that's their future thank you thank you very much lala win and uh, no i think there's a question probably for priya in the chat box from jason from adb it's it's about uh, the fact that you now with the pandemic uh, a lot of screenings that uh, should have happened are not happening so she's yes, asking yeah. how technology could help in that respect And then I have a question for two of you, all of you. 
we can start with P and then uh, we complete the round. Obviously, from what shared uh, technology, digital technologies are offering so many opportunities. But at the same time, you all talked about, you know, collecting data, tracking uh, devices. Uh, you know, these sometimes are personal information that maybe we don't want to share, you know, or we want to keep private. So how can we make sure that, you know, while, you know, getting the good uh, aspects, uh, you know, these technological developments, uh, we uh, work to ensure that uh, sensitive information is not ending up in, uh, you know, uh, bad hands or, you know, a group of people we don't want to share the information with. And let's start perhaps with Priya, and then uh, we also get the perspective from these two Lalas. Priya, over to you. Right. Um, to answer Jason's question regarding um, screening for various diseases uh, during the pandemic, that's absolutely true. Uh, because of the pandemic, uh, there have not only uh, been uh, people who have avoided going to hospitals and seeing doctors because of the pandemic. Um, they've not sc been screened at all. And uh, because of this, I'm sure that there are a lot of people who are suffering. Um, and even the treatments for these things, let's say people were detected, even um, treatments for things like cancer had stopped in various hospitals because they became COVID hospitals and then so on and so forth. So it's it's been a very bad cascading effect. But I do think technology plays a huge role in a couple of things, specifically in primary healthcare. So primary healthcare, uh, if I just put it very simply, um, in a situation where you don't need to rush to the hospital if it's not an emergency situation, um, there are there's a lot of self-education that I feel nowadays... Um, we as people have to do about our own health and well-being. Anyway, health and well-being has become center stage. All of us were taking vitamins and all those things to increase our immunity during COVID times. And, um, you know, people have started to really be aware of some of these things. And COVID is not the only disease. There are a lot of diseases that we need to be aware of and educate ourselves how to protect ourselves and prevent ourselves for these diseases. And many of these diseases also have symptoms. For example, breast cancer is one of the most common things that affects women. And I think not enough women know how to screen themselves for breast cancer at an early age. And these are a few things that there can be things that are provided online for people to go through and self screen. Um, apart from this, I think screening can come into the picture in mental health also in a big way. It's not only physical health. Uh, for example, there are various questionnaires. There are things that you can do to understand um, the preliminary stage of your mental well-being if you need to go see a therapist if you need to go see a psychiatrist etc i think screening plays a role where you yourself can be aware of do i need to see a specialist or not and i think that is where having this um, education online understanding your own symptoms being aware even as parents understanding uh, from a child's health perspective when they are going through something it's very difficult to do that because we are not doctors but i think in today's day and age um it's very important for us to know these things from an early stage um Unfortunately, the diagnosis cannot be done without a doctor present. And so if we feel like after we have screened ourselves, we should get in touch with a doctor and technology is helping us in such a huge way to get in touch with doctors, even people who are there for surgeries, they're sending their reports to doctors in different cities and different countries, they're getting consultations. So I think that way the game from technology has completely changed. Um, but the patient themselves, like all of us, need to screen need to ensure we are preventively screening ourselves uh, even technology has allowed people to book tests at home you can get a blood test done at home today so it's important for us to get a blood test done at home check if everything is fine and the connectivity um, you don't have to wait in queues for doctors anymore like i said you can consult a doctor from your phone um that's what i would say about screening i would not say that uh things like early stage cancer can be screened at home uh, by people themselves, you still possibly need to go to a doctor, but um, uh, the advancements are helping. Secondly, coming to the data, health data is also a big problem. Uh, today, data is another huge problem. Of course, we know that with social media, Facebook and other organizations uh, coming under the radar for things like that. I think there are very strict regulations when it comes to healthcare data already in the US and other countries. India has also released an entire 
another piece where you need to encrypt the data in a very specific way. I think that same law does not apply to our regular data. For example, my location or, uh, for example, if I share a picture of me and my friends, the same laws do not apply. But with healthcare data, I think they definitely do apply. And, um, you know, when I'm saying that we're going to take this data and see if we can detect and diagnose things at an early stage, um, that data is not visible to a human being. Uh, I think the data is going into an algorithm and that algorithm uh, is de-identifying your information and, of course, using that uh, to come to conclusions. So I think it's important for us as well to understand um, technology ourselves so that we know how much we're sharing and how much we're not sharing and where that information is going. It is important because it's healthcare information. We also don't want other people to know what health issues we have. But at the same time, we want our doctor to know what health issues we have. So I think the government is making a lot of policy comes in here in a big way. Um, and I think the government itself is coming up with regulations so our data can be safe and secure. Um, there's also like a third comment about health tracking devices. Uh, they should be made affordable. Um, I think, yes, uh, you know, uh, the cost of even sequencing your genome has dropped so much. You can go get a genetic test done um, in much in one fourth of the price it was five years ago, you know, so you can, it just keeps, it just keeps dropping. So I think as the uh, years go by, the uh, affordability of any technology will just keep increasing. So that Thank you very much for these very important points. Uh, now, uh, Lala Wynn, anything you would like to add before we run out of time? Over to you. I think it's important to invest in the uh, data uh, security and also privacy as a policy level. And also very important to educate the children and the young adults and, you know, even parents about this uh, digital literacy. What should be, uh, you know, uh, put out there? What shouldn't be and how to protect even like basic thing like password and all this, you know, personal data not to share. And, and for the digital company, like as uh, it's very important to you know use on the um, the sec security budget you know security budget and how to encrypt all this data and not you know uh, not just literally names and all the data out there um, it's time to get active in the regularly uh, fine tuning of our security tools as well, so that we can uh, avoid the uh, risk of being attacked and you know, um, hand for threats. Thank you very much. Uh, Lala Ruh, over to you. Um, yes, I'd just like to add something. I think Priya and Lala Wynn have already mentioned um, so many important points, like you know, policymakers, how they need to you know, ensure that regulations are in place so that you know, um, our data is safe. And I think with regards to girls, um, and then I'm thinking about, you know, the, the, with context to Pakistan, but I'm sure this is applicable uh, in other parts of the world as well, that, you know, digital spaces need to be made safe for women. Um, and it's important to understand what are the gender specific barriers that, you know, what are the barriers or what are the uh, problems that women face, you know, um, in Pakistan, for example, there are certain norms and stereotypes, you know, when we saw uh, when 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 the pandemic arrived, and for example, in in our work, we saw that there was a, there's a lot of reluctance uh, that in a household, girls or women, young women will usually not have access to a digit uh, to a smartphone or to um, you know the internet, and a lot of of course the, the socioeconomic background, uh, the socioeconomic um, uh, condition of a family also depends uh, you know affects on this you know that if there's just one device in the house, maybe that's you know, owned by the brother or the father. But at the same time, there's also this, um, these gender norms and stereotypes that maybe being on the internet is not safe for my daughter. Uh, maybe it's not something good for them. Uh, and, and maybe they should not own a smartphone. So these are cultural, you know, uh, barriers or gender norms and stereotypes. And the more the, these digital spaces are safe, uh, the more girls feel safe and the more they feel that they can be themselves, the more their families are educated on this and their programs run that inform uh, parents and teachers and community members on how these devices or how being in a digital world can transform um, our women's or, or girls' lives. It's really important that, you know, that kind of awareness is spread and then 
we also ensure that girls are safe and for that you have to there need to be laws there need to be policies but there also needs to be a change in the mindset you know uh, the behaviors um, of people how they interact with women um and and also women realizing what what kind of information they can share how they can stay safe and how generally we can make these spaces uh, you know safer for women thank you very much lala ruh i think this is perfect conclusion and this something that we care very much about at area in our policy papers we state very clearly that if we want more women girls in the digital economy the digital space need to be a safe environment for women and you know that's not just about you know cyber uh, violence which is obviously extremely important but it is also about uh, stereotypes and biases sometimes they are a bit hidden uh, and there is emerging evidence that some of the biases and stereotypes that are you know uh, already in many societies are actually incorporated in the, dig the digital sphere so i will leave you with this if you have not uh, thought about it uh, most of uh, digital assistant existing uh, online they have female names why is that because this is obviously reflecting some biases we have uh, in different societies uh, around the world thank you very much to all our panelists and also to alessia for her introductory remarks um uh, lara ruh rawin and priya we hope to stay in touch and see you soon uh, back uh, at some other events organized by area and asia network and to all participants please connect soon to the fourth and final session of this event we are going to talk about cambodia and the forthcoming asean chairmanship thank you very much bye bye thank you thank you